morning again to each one of you. <clears throat> I just want to once again pause for a moment to praise God for Elder John. To a lot of us, it is very shocking, but God knows what he's doing. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, God says, For we know that in all these things, God works together for good to those who love him. We want to praise God for John's life in each and every one of our lives. How he's touched us, how he's blessed us. The passion, as Elder Arthur said this morning, the passion that he had in doing God's work right up till the end. Right up till the end. And a lot of us saw him during that evening of 19th of December where he was facilitating the annual Christmas service. Right up till the end, he was a very, very beneficial worker to Christ right up till the end. And we praise God for that. But we know that whilst God has called him last night, there is hope as Brother Ned just read. In John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, let not your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. In my Father's hands are many mansions. And if you were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So there is hope. While physically we may, we may have lost Elder John, but by faith, we can believe that there is hope beyond death. That if you are faithful to God on that resurrection morning, we will all rise to see Elder John and praise God together with him. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the promise that you've given us from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. We ask God that you will help us to hold on to that hope during this very sad time for a lot of us. We pray that you will especially comfort John's family, his dear wife, his dear children, Katie, Helen, and Sarah, and all the rest of us who will miss him tremendously. Father, as I share your word this morning, I ask that you will speak through me that the message will not come from me, but rather from you speaking through me that the message that you want a congregation to listen. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with each one of us, imbue us with the Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> During the World War II, during World War II, do we know when the World War II took place, children? 1939 Yeah, yeah, in the 1940s, is it 1939 to 1940s? So, <clears throat> General Douglas MacArthur, it may be that some of you have heard of him, General Douglas MacArthur is an American. And he was given the responsibility as a field marshal. And his responsibility was to go to the Philippines and protect those people from those Japanese invasion. Because during the World War, the Japanese were really fighting, and so were all other countries. So his role, General MacArthur, was to go to the Philippines and protect the people from that terrible invasion from the Japanese. So he went there, but in March of 1942, he had to flee the Philippines due to the intensity of the invasion by the Japanese. When he fled the Philippines, he didn't return to the United States, but he went across to nearby Australia. When he landed in Australia, he made this very very powerful statement, a very popular statement too. 
and he says, I came out from Bataan, and I shall return. I came out from Bataan, and I shall return. Over two centuries ago, Jesus makes this promise, the same promise to us, as we have read in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will return. And it is a promise. He will return. But when will Jesus return? What will be the signs of his return? Jesus doesn't give us the time of his return. However, he's given us signs to look out for in preparation for his soon coming. So turn with me now to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and we'll pick it up from verse 3. Matthew chapter 20, 24, verse 3. And, he sa- as, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So his disciples is ask, are asking him, What will be the signs of your coming, dear Jesus? And Jesus answered, and he said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So he starts off by saying, Do not let men deceive you. And he carried on by saying, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and and shall deceive many. Verse 5 is also very similar to verse 11. So if you quickly jump to verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. So now Jesus is saying many false Christs and many false prophets will will rise and deceive many. Let's move on. And ye shall hear wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And these are the beginning of sorrows. And I know in other Bible translation, it says, and these are the beginning of birth pain. So if you hang on to that, but I'm going to stop there for now. So what do we see here? There'll be false Christs and false prophets arising to deceive people prior to Christ's coming. Have we seen that occurring? Have we heard of false Christs and false prophets claiming to be Christ? Lots of them. Okay, right. So who have we got? Jim Jones. Has anyone heard of Jim Jones? In the 1970s, he lived till 1978. He claimed to be the reincarnation of Christ. But he didn't just claim to be the reincarnation of Christ. He claimed also to be Buddha, to be Father Divine, and many others. He claimed to be Father Divine, but Father Divine himself claimed to be the reincarnation of Christ. So can you see the confusion that's happening out there with various people? So Jim Jones claimed to be the reincarnation of Christ. But what did he do? He committed a mass murder suicide in 1978. November of 1978 in Jonestown in Guyana, South America, he committed a murder suicide. And then he ended up shooting himself. So he's dead. Who else? Jose Louis de Jesus. Has anyone heard of Jose Louis de Jesus? Puerto Rican guy, a Puerto Rican leader, and he's also a leader of one of the religious sects. And what did he say? In 2007, he said that Christ 
integrates himself inside his body. That was his claim. And what about David Koresh? I'm sure some of us have heard of him. Some, some of us are older. David Koresh, I won't go into his background, but you do your research at the end of church service today, and I'll ask you if you can do that. But he was the leader of the branch Davidian sect. And he had plenty of followers with him. They lived in a ranch in Waco, Texas. And again, Waco, David Koresh, might have rung bells to some of us. It did, certainly with me. And so this sect of people, of people, they lived in this ranch in Waco, Texas. But in 1983, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms got a, an arrest warrant to go in and search the ranch and to arrest him. Why? Because there, was, there were allegations that they were manufacturing firearms and weapons. But when, when they arrived there, there was a crossfire. There was resistance from people within the ranch. There was resistance. And that led to a siege by the FBI. And that siege of the ranch lasted over a month, I think some 51 days. But the outcome of the siege was that there was a terrible fire and everyone within that ranch, all 76 people, including David Koresh, died in that fire. And David Koresh had claimed that he was the son of God and the last prophet standing. And yet he had so many followers, people who believed in what he said. What about prosperity gospel? Has anyone heard of prosperity gospel or prosperity theology or the health and well-being theology? Has anyone heard of that? What does it promise us? Okay. What? Yeah, he does. He, yeah, he promised that it is the will of God that people who join the prosperity theology will remain financially well off and materially well off. But is that what Jesus promised in the Bible? We heard this morning from Sabbath School lesson. The rich people, Solomon, Job, Job was so rich, he was reaching out to help others. And yet he suffered. So Jesus did not promise us that if you join a, a Christian religion, you will always be blessed with financial blessing, or you will always remain rich for the rest of your life. So don't be deceived. Do your research. Read the Bible. Go to the Bible. Pray about it. And let God lead you to the truth. So we heard of false Christs and false prophets arising to deceive many. What else have we heard? We have heard of wars and rumors of wars. And so we have the war at Ukra in Ukraine. It's lasted almost a year. February was, well, there was the beginning of the war, wasn't it? In February or April of last year. And it's still going on. And what is the impact of the war on the rest of the world? Rising utility, utility bills, rising gas. Ukraine is, is renowned for supplying grain. And Russia is renowned, is, is the big exporter of fertilizer. What could the potential impact of this continual war be on the rest of the world? So wars are happening, and a few weeks ago, we heard of the war between Kosovo and Serbia. So it's happening. What else have we heard from the Bible? The Bible we've just read, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. Have we seen enough of that? That terrible fam famine in Somalia that was reported towards the end of last year, unseen of, unheard of, that level of famine. What about that US bomb cyclone? that happened two weeks ago where millions of people were living in a, in a state where in states where the temperature had dropped to minus 45 degrees Celsius. And in this country, when it's not degrees 
or one degree, we are all shaking. Imagine minus 45 degrees Celsius. Many people died. The earthquakes that we hear of. And how often have we heard recently on news that people often make comments in terms of the US bomb cyclone? They commented that it was a once in a generation experience. It's never happened before. And I've heard also during the course of last year, when we had terrible snowstorm, terrible floods, terrible fires. Remember we had the warmest, warmest summer last year. It was reported that we had the warmest summer last year. And a lot of people commented, I've never seen that in my lifetime. So when Jesus said, and these are the beginning of sorrows, these are the beginning of birth pains. I mean, mothers, what does it suggest to you when Jesus says here, these are the beginning of birth pains? When a woman conceives, they will experience pain. But as the fetus develops, the pain will increase in intensity and frequency. So that's what Jesus is suggesting here, that the atrocities that happen in this world, the signs of his coming, the earthquakes, the famines, the snowstorms, the cyclones, the climate changes will increase in intensity and frequency. And have we not witnessed that already? Have we not witnessed, for those of us who have lived longer, 30, 40 years ago, what were the earthquakes like? What were the floods like? What were the famines like? What were the weather like? What was the weather like? And 40 years on, have they not increased in intensity and frequency? And what does that suggest to us? What does that suggest to us? Should we not be sitting up on our seats? And know that when we see all these signs that Christ is coming is nigh. Or are we just still being very complacent, coming to church, sitting on our seats and warming our seats, thinking that, oh, you know, Christ has been, you know, forecasting all this and saying all this, but yet I have not yet seen Christ come. Probation ends for you tonight, maybe. Probation ended for John last night. We are not promised tomorrow. We are not promised this afternoon. We have to be ready every second of the day. Let us not live in complacency. Let's carry on. Let's carry on and see what else are the signs of Christ's coming. Let's move on to verse 9. Carry on from verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And as I said earlier, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The love of many will grow cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And verse 14, and the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Let's stop there. What else have we read here? What else have we read here? You'll be persecuted. The day will come when we will be persecuted. There are already Christians in other countries that are suffering persecution for their faith. So we need to be praying for these people. Not just these people, we need to pray for ourselves that we are ready, that we will be ready when we are, that we will be persecuted. It may be that some people have already been persecuted in various forms. Keeping the Sabbath, honoring the Sabbath. I know when I was living in Malaysia, students attending universities, they were having to sit for the exams on the Sabbath day. Trial, it's a type of trial, it's a type of persecution. 
but those young people stood up for Christ. They want, they love Christ so much because, and they want to keep God's Sabbath. And they stood up and prayed and said that we will never sit for our exam on the Sabbath day. And they prayed, and the church prayed for them, and the pastor prayed for them, and the church intervened. And we saw blessings, God's blessings, transpired to help these people not to break the Sabbath. So the time of persecution will come. And Jesus tells us very clearly that the Sunday law will come. What does that mean to us? What does that mean that the Sunday law will come to us? Are we keeping the Sabbath as we should be all this time? Do we come to church in the morning and then play football in the afternoon? Do we come to church in the morning and then read our secular books in the afternoon? Or look up all the social platforms in the afternoon? Or go to the cinema in the afternoon? If you don't observe the Sabbath right now, today, we will never do so when the Sunday law is passed. We cannot just change in an instant of, in, in instantly when the Sunday law is passed. If you're not faithful in keeping the Sabbath now, you will never be faithful when the Sunday law is passed. What else have we seen? The love of many will wax cold. Turn with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. These know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despises of those that are good terrible world, terrible world that we are living in right now. And these are some of the signs of Christ's coming. The love of many will wax cold. Have you seen all this happening? Parents are abusing children. Children are abusing their parents. Husbands are abusing wives and vice versa. Terrible atrocities are happening. Crimes are happening. Tra crimes are rife. The love of many will wax cold. 38 people looking out of their window in a respectful suburban area in New York City. They watch a murder that took half an hour to commit and did nothing. 38 people looking out the window of a suburban respectful area of New York and watched a murder that took half an hour to commit and did nothing. Psychiatrists suggest that we have spent so much time in front of the television watching violence after violence, sexual immorality, all sorts of terrible awful, immoral films, that we have become so desensitized, our minds have become so desensitized, that when a real event like a murder takes place in front of us, they no longer have personal impact on us. Think about it, reflect on it. Are we in that position today? How long are we spending our time watching rubbish, in our opinion, rubbish in front of the television? I met up with a friend this week, and she said, oh, I, I love watching um, documentaries on murderers um, and how people, how murderers kill others, you know, and all that and everything. And when she kept talking to me about it, I could see that, 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 that evil 
evil look in their face. Why would anyone be so interested in watching and in knowing more about murderers, what they do, the events that took place, the processes that happened, and how they kill one person after another, the trauma that caused to these victims? Why would anyone be interested in that? And then when they see the real people who are in trouble, they wash their hands off that and do nothing. How often do we see that? The love of many will wax cold. We know and we have sinned and it's increased in intensity, in frequency. And to me, it tells me that Christ is coming is really very, very soon. We are seven days into the new year, seven days closer to Christ's coming. So it's telling me that Christ's coming is very soon. But why is Jesus not here yet? Where's Jesus? Why is Jesus not here yet? Us. Waiting for us to do what? To repent. to repent, absolutely. Absolutely. Ellen G. White. Ellen G. White is, um, we, we consider her as a prophetess of Christ. And she said that in mercy, Christ delayed his coming in mercy because he knows that if he, we, he was to come today, None of us will be ready to see him. And he said true. He said true. I want to read something else to you. I want to read something else to you. Last day events. Okay? I want to read it to you and I want us to reflect on it for two sec couple of minutes. Last day events, page 39. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Let us reflect on this. Let me read that again. Christ is waiting for longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then Christ will come to claim them as his own. How do we communicate with one another? Do we show Christ's love to others when somebody has done us wrong? What would Jesus do in your position if you were in that situation? Would Jesus treat you the way you treat others? And Alan G. White said it before. Alan G. White said that if Christ had treated us the way we have treated others, we would have been completely destroyed. I think Sister Mara, you want to say something? I, I just... I'm so sorry to interrupt. I forgot that you're not supposed to join the No, no, that's fine. No, no, that's um, we can. I was just wondering, you know the, the element you read out from that yeah. document. Where is it in the back? Would it be okay to yeah. the text? I can share that with you at the end of this service. It's not in the Bible. It's a supplementary information that's been written in a book called The Last Day Events. Okay. But I'll share it with you later on. Okay. Yeah. So think about our interaction with one another. Our interaction, remember the love of others will wax cold. Think about our interaction within our own families. How do we communicate with our wives, with our husbands, with our partners, with our siblings? And then how do we communicate with people whom we call brothers and sisters in Christ? When they do not meet our expectations, when they do not meet our needs, how do we communicate with them? We are so quick 
to criticize others, aren't we? And that's the truth, isn't it? This, 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 this should, should give us an opportunity to, to be more introspective about ourselves. We are seven days into the new year, seven days nearer to crisis coming. We may not have the opportunity of another day like Elder John. Tomorrow is not promised to, to us. How can we continue to behave the way that we have done and expect to be translated into heaven when Christ comes or when we die? If you're not ready to behave like citizens of heaven, if you're not ready to behave as citizens of heaven today, we will never be ready to behave like citizens of heaven when Christ comes. Today is the day. Today is the day. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Christ has said it very clearly that his delayed is coming because he wants to give us that chance to repent, to confess, and to accept Christ. So what do we need to do in the meantime? Come with me to Matthew chapter 24. Now, actually, I want to go to Mark. Mark, Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Would somebody like to read it? Mark chapter 13, verses 35 to 37. Mark chapter 13, verses 35 to 37. Would anyone like to read? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Watch that for the eternal world when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the beginning, I will do so all in the morning. That's the command to the name. He finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Watch. <clears throat> so what's the key word here? What is the repetitive, rep repetitive word here? What? Watch. What does it mean to watch? What, 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 what does it mean to watch? We've got watchtowers, haven't we? Like in, in the sea, you know, like we have like North Holland watchtower. What is the purpose of having a watchtower? What is the purpose of having a watchman? What is Christ telling us here to watch? Absolutely, yeah. To be constantly being alert, to be watching, to be waiting, to be looking out, to be looking out potential signs of danger, isn't it? Watch. So how do we do that? How do we watch? Christ has given us a guidance here. Watch. How do we do it? Bible study, prayer. Prayer, Bible study. Remember Enoch? Enoch walked with the Lord 300 years. 300 years. And an average human being today walks with God three score and 10 years, an average of 70 years. And yet we fall short of God's character and God's glory. Enoch walked with God 300 years. And the end result was that he was translated into heaven without seeing death. But what did he not do? Again, in the last day events, the divine inspiration writes that Enoch educated his mind and his heart to feel that he was in the presence of God all the time, every day, every second of the day. He educated his mind and heart to feel that he was in the presence of God. And if we, if we do that as Enoch, what a difference it would be in our interaction with one another. Because we will always be cautious that Christ is here, Christ is next to me. Am I saying what Christ would want me to say? Am I behaving in a way that Christ would want me to behave? Am I treating others with that compassion, that empathy that Christ would want me to behave towards others? Am I sensitive to other people's needs? Or do I just listen and then start preaching to them and then walk away, wash my hands and walk away and do nothing? Remember, Enoch, 
he educated his mind and heart to feel that he was in the presence of God. And when in perplexity, his prayers would ascend to God to keep him. There is a lesson for us that we shall walk with God every day. And we are not safe unless we are waiting and watching. So prayer, Bible study, the Bible is important. We must, we must. It's not, we could, we must saturate our minds with God's words. How often do you young people read the Bible? Every day. The, 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 all, the, all the young people say it's every day. What about the young, young children? How often do you read the Bible? Let, let's see. Amen. Once a day, amen. <clears throat> so we must saturate our minds with scriptures, with the word of God. We must commit scriptures to memory. We hear, we read from Matthew chapter 24, that the time of persecution will come. And when the Sunday law is passed, a lot of us who are faithful to God will run away out of the city, into the countryside, up into the mountains, away from those, those persecutors that are chasing after us. We may not have our Bible with us, but the only thing we have is our mind, our brains. And if you have educated our minds to memorize, to commit scriptures to, 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 to mind, then we have no fear because we will always go to God. We will always bring God's promises. Think about Psalms 46, chapter 1 to 3. In fact, a lot of people are frightened. The, 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 the idea of crisis coming, the atrocities that, that are happening, and especially the seven plagues, the, the, the plagues that are coming prior to crisis coming. Can you imagine the water turning into blood? That's going to frighten the life out of every, a lot of us. Who has ever seen Folkestone Sea turn into red blood? Can you imagine the Folkestone Sea water turn into, into blood? How might you feel then? I would be petrified. I'm petrified of blood anyway. But if I see a sea full of blood. Over a decade ago, a film was made called 2012. And it depicted the story of mountains and cities crumbling. It depicted Los Angeles sliding into the Pacific Ocean as a result of, nuclear, of a nuclear blast. And that frightened the life out of lots of people. And a similar event will happen. Similar event will happen. But what did Psalms 46 verses 1 to 3 say? If you commit those text, these scriptures to your memory, this will bring comfort to you. Psalms chapter 46 verses 1 to 3. The Lord is my refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, I will not fear, even if the earth gives way and mountains fall into the heart of the seas, even if the rivers roar and foam and the mountains quake with the surging. Therefore, I will not fear. Whatever happens, Christ will be with me. But imagine if you haven't got all these scriptures in your mind and you've got persecutors chasing after you, trying to persecute you and kill you and torture you. You have no Christ, you have no Bible, you've got nothing. How will you survive those times of persecution? So commit those texts to scriptures. Every morning when I go for my walk, I memorize a variety of texts and I try to learn new ones as time goes by. And Psalms 91 is a very powerful one. And that will be a very comforting one. Psalms 91, I will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stop in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys it at midday. Because all these will come our way, but I will not fear because we know that Christ will be with us. There are so many texts. Make it your goal. I don't, I don't like Christmas and New Year's resolution. I don't do New Year's resolution. I think those are fake. 
But let me give you a challenge. Make it your challenge. Alex, Blake, Mark, Natty, Max, Junior, and Dima, Danai, and everyone else of us. Make it your challenge to memorize a text. One a week or one a month. And by and after 30 or 60 days, you have quite a few texts in your mind and they will come in so useful. Not just when the Sunday law is passed, but today as you walk, as you face the battle of each day, whatever battles that we face, we face challenges every day. And we have to remember, we have to bring these facts to mind that God is our comforter, that God is our strength, that God will be with us through every trials and temptations that we face, every challenges that we face. Turn our worries into prayers. Take away our worries and replace it with scriptures, comforting scriptures that will give us the strength to go through the challenges that we face daily. So in the meantime, while waiting for Christ to come, we pray. Pray, remember, remember what Enoch did? He was constantly walking in the presence of God. Make that your aim. Imagine that you're always walking in the presence of God. What would Jesus do if he's just sat next to me, if I'm faced with a situation? Pray, Bible study, commit scriptures to God. What else? Turn with me. Turn with me to Matthew. Chapter 24, verses 45 to 47. Matthew chapter 24. If anyone finds it, can you read it, please? Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 to 47. Is a faithful and wise who must not from no food over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant who his master when he comes for past his dinner. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him all his dinner. Amen. So, what is this text telling us? Does it tell us to, while waiting for Christ, just sit back, fold your arms, do nothing? We kind of alluded to some of this this morning during the Sabbath school. We've got a role to play. We've got work to do whilst waiting for Christ to come. Remember the story of the talents, and it's found in Matthew chapter. We won't go to it because I'm conscious of the time. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. The story about the talents. This master went away and gave each one. Some talents. One he gave five talents, one he gave two, and another one he gave one. And what did all of them do? We know that the, that the one who was given five and two went on to invest those talents and they got more. And the one who was given one talent when it hit, hit, hit that and did nothing and it didn't grow. So, what is that trying to tell us? What do we need to do when the master is away? Keep busy. Keep busy doing God's work. You know what? There are so many people crying out for a telephone call, for a visit. We went to, Sister Sylvia and I went to visit Sister Pauline. We haven't seen her or heard from her. I think the last time I saw her was what, spring or summer of last year when I first came to this church. And then we didn't see her anymore. Uh, Sister Sylvia couldn't get hold of Sister Pauline. And so we were worried. So we went to visit her. And uh, when we entered the flat and it was dark. The curtains were drawn and the atmosphere appeared gloomy. And at the end of that visit, at the end of the half hour I was visit, the curtain was drawn open and she came up and talked to us and took us to the door and she was so happy. She had fallen and she just dislocated her shoulder and fractured her, her upper arm, her lower arm, her main arm. Nobody knew. We didn't know. None of us knew. And yet, she's on, 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 our, on our friends of our church list. None of us knew. Nobody cared. She dislocated her shoulder. She fractured her arm. 
She sustained a mini stroke prior to the fall. And she's been diagnosed with vascular dementia. Did anyone know? Did anyone care? That's why I say it. Lots of people are crying out for a phone call, for a visit. If each one of us here can take the responsibility each, each one of us, not just depend on the pastoral team, being the pastor and the elders to do the visits, but if each one of us here can take a name each from our church list of family and friends, members and friends, and just pick up the phone, or maybe take a visit to them, that would make heaven so happy. That would make them so happy. Pauline was so pleased and so happy at the end of that, at the end of that visit. Her flag was lighter and brighter, and the curtain was drawn, 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 drawn apart. Christ wants us to do that. Don't give excuses just because we don't drive, just because we haven't got money in a pocket, just because we're too old. Just because we're too busy with our full-time job? Just because we don't speak English? Just because you're a child or a young person? No excuse. Remember, God gives us talents according to what we think we can manage. To the person with five, we give five because he knows that person can manage a lot more. Five. To the person who, who may not manage as well as the person with five talents, we give two and then one. So to all of us, God has given us the skills and the talents and the spiritual gifts and make the most of it. While waiting for Christ to come, God wants us to do that. Reach out to others. Don't waste our time hiding our talents. Yeah, all of us here have got talents and skills and knowledge and everything. Use them to the glory of God's work. Even it means, even if it means just to pray for someone. <laughs> what else? <clears throat> so finally, again, Ellen G. White, pen of inspiration in the last eight events. She says that whilst we are waiting for Christ to come. We need to use that time as a time for serious reflection. Serious reflection. So what are we reflecting on? When is my money going to come in next? How much money am I going to grow? How much money can I keep investing? How many houses can I purchase for? When can I get those big Mercedes Benz to drive? Are those issues that LNG White is referring to? When she says the time of serious reflection. But tell you what she suggests. We need to reflect on is my soul temple cleansed of its defilement? If it's not cleansed, then we need to pray like the disciples, like we've never prayed before. Pray like Jacob. When he was struggling with God at Jebok, he was struggling with God, consistency, persistency. And he says to God, that I will not let thee go unless you bless me. So this is what we need to do, Christ. Are there any sins within me that needs to be cleansed? Humble me that I will be able to ask for forgiveness of that person. That person has caused me grief, and I cannot forgive that person. Month after month, year after year, I cannot forgive that person. We cannot do anything on our own. Only Christ can help us. Is my soul temple, is your soul temple cleansed of its defilement? Second, have I confessed my sins to God that they may be blotted out? It is so important to ask for forgiveness every day because we sin every minute of every day. We have fallen so far and so short of God's glory and God's character. And we need to ask God for forgiveness. Have I confessed my sins to God that they may be blotted out? 
do I feel the third? Do I feel every moment I'm not my own, but Christ's property, that my service belong to God? So whatever you do, do it with the purpose of Christ in your mind. And finally, for what am I living and working for? You know, sometimes it, it seems like it's vanity and vanity, and that's what Solomon said. He's such a rich man, he's got all the women in the world and everything, and yet he will say, everything is vanity. Everything is in vain. So when you work every day, when you go to work every day, when you go to university to aim for that highest degree, what is that purpose for? Is it to bring glory to God? Or what? Or what am I looking, living and working for? Each one of us is responsible for our own spiritual preparation, our spiritual condition. Elder Arthur cannot prepare for Sister Mariana. She is accountable to Christ as an individual. We have to do our own preparation ourselves. Like the story of the 10 virgins in Matthew chapter 25. You know, whilst they were waiting, they were waiting for the master, the, the, the bridegroom to come, there were five who took lands and, and, and oil, and the other five took lands without the oil. And at the last minute, when the bridegroom comes, they were going to those people with the, with the oil and said, please, please give us some, some, some oil because we can't buy our land. They said, no, sorry, we have need enough for ourselves. We have to, we should have, you should go and buy some yourself. So remember, preparation for Christ's coming is your responsibility and your responsibility alone. You cannot depend on another individual to prepare your spiritual life, to prepare your spiritual condition for Christ's coming. We all have got our individual accountability to Christ. So it is your responsibility. Don't rely on another person. Just want to end with uh, <clears throat> this statement from Last Day Event again. Last Day Event is such a beautiful book. I don't own it, but I intend to buy it now. I actually borrowed it from Sister Erica in Canterbury, and I've been reading it. And it's you know I just wish I could just highlight it, but it's not my book, so I couldn't do it. Uh, but I would urge all of you. As we stand at the last day of, you know, towards Christ's coming, do invest in that book, The Last Day Events. Beautiful book, very powerful book. And again, in The Last Day Events, and, and it is a quote from a letter that Ellen G. White had written in 1897. And she said, The Lord has wisely concealed this from us, concealed the time of his appearing. So I repeat again, the Lord has wisely concealed the time of his appearing from us that we may always be in a state of expectancy and preparation for the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. Will you be ready when Jesus comes? Will I be ready when Jesus comes? And it's a question that only you can answer. Amen.